Yeah, yeah, what up? It is BQ here. This is the Impact Lounge, and this is your Rebellion Night 2 review. I'm going to get into Rebellion, but let me tell you a story first of all. When I started podcasting years ago, I was the king of technical difficulties. I could never just smoothly record my podcast. Some some people are out there, they're lucky, they, they record, they stream, they do whatever, and it comes out just fine. Now, if you've been riding with me for a long time, there was a portion of time for about a month where Robbie E. was part of the podcast. Robbie E. of TNA fame. So he would bring guests on for interviews, and my first guest was DJ Z. Now, of course, there were some technical difficulties at the time we were going to do it, so we ended up doing it several hours later, and, and, and everything was cool. Next interview we do is Diana Perrazzo, and um, we have problems up the ass for that one. And it wasn't really technical. It was trying to, we were having issues with, well, we were having issues with Skype. Uh, Robbie, my other two guests, I mean, my other two hosts, we were on, but we couldn't get Deanna on. So that was a big mess. And then um, I forgot who we, what we did after that. And then we did ODB. Actually, we never did ODB. That one never, never uh, came to fruition because that particular night, Everything was just not working. It just wasn't happening. And uh, this actually led to the fallout that him and I kind of had. Uh, because he, you know, after the DJ Z one, he was cool. But after that, he was getting actually pretty mad. <laughs> um, and I think he said I was embarrassing him. So uh, we kind of we kind of fell out after that. And I decided I didn't want to uh, continue the partnership. And... Um, this was about three years ago, four years ago, and uh, I still have these damn problems. That's kind of one of the reasons I bowed out of pod bowed out of podcasting for a while was just because I was sick of it. I was tired of it. I got too much going on in my personal life to have these issues. So last week we tried to stream Rebellion episode one, and that was a big nightmare. Um video wise but we were able to stream audio last night was rebellion night two i was fairly certain i had the, the kinks worked out uh we were not able to stream video or audio so then we just recorded the normal podcast like i'm talking to you right now we recorded a normal podcast and the idea was for me to get it up in the morning <laughs> get it up in the morning anyway that's a little that's what she said joke but the idea was to upload it in the morning, and that did not happen because when I opened up my laptop, the file did not freaking record. And we were recording this pretty late because we were having so many problems. And um, I just don't have good luck when it comes to these uh, podcasts as soon as I'm bringing someone else on. I can do these solo ones all day, but as soon as I bring someone on I have problems and that's why I kind of even taken a break from doing interviews for a while because it always scares me to death that it's not going to work now thank god I've never had that issue for my interviews since I've been you know ever since the ODB fiasco years ago uh, you know I haven't had the issues ever since thank god so that was kind of a long opening and I'm sorry that it's not the way I usually choose the podcast I'm not one of those dudes who like you know, uh, likes to get into my day and everything. I usually like to just get into what you're here for, but I kind of wanted to put that out there and to thank you for just riding with me through, through everything. You know, um, there's a lot of things that I say impact should do this. And, and then I, I say, Oh, well, I know this about social media and this and this, and I know I don't necessarily follow through on my end. You know, like I always give them a hard time for the Twitch and the impact plus shows where all the technical difficulties, but then I have it on my end. I mean, the difference is I do this in my spare time and I, I you know, I don't do this full time. This isn't something that's feeding my family. So, um, I don't go all in like I probably should, but, uh, we're going to go all into this rebellion night Two review rebellion night Two way the F better than night one. In my opinion, 
Uh, some of you may disagree. You may think that they were both on the same level. I don't think for a second. Uh, last night, last week, had some good matches or whatever. But this 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 episode was was really really on point. The commentary was so much better than it was last week. I crucified Josh and Madison last week and basically said that was the worst commentary that I've heard on an impact broadcast in years. And this includes Jeremy Borash. It includes Don Callis. You know, this was last week was horrendous. And this week was a complete 180. I enjoyed the commentary. They provided something. You know, it wasn't it wasn't inside jokes and bad humor and some and the humor that was actually there actually was good. You know, Madison uh, sounded great this episode, and Josh is starting to back off on that thing that Don Callis taught him, where he just just asked me questions the whole match. He's starting to like call the action. You know what I mean? He took it back to basics here a little bit and just went to the Josh Matthews he knows he can be. So I really enjoyed the commentary through this episode, and I really had no no complaints about it whatsoever. Can you believe that? So uh, it opens up with this video package, and last week I was a little critical of this video package because it started off, I mean, it, w- it was great, but it was, you know, if you're going to go, go all in, that was kind of the theme. Now, these, these themes that they're kicking off the shows with, I really hope these are mission statements that they choose to follow going forward because go all in they they don't you know there there's a lot of corners that they cut uh there's some areas where they do go all in usually with the the wrestling itself you know they go all in but there's there's corners that they cut and this time it was invent yourself to reinvent yourself again sounds great sounds great on paper but uh sometimes i i worry are you really in in reinventing yourself because there's so much reliance on the TNA library and what AJ Styles did on this day in history. And uh, TNA is even part of the show now. You know, so, uh, it's different now. I kind of get why they're doing it, but, you know, are they totally reinventing themselves? Yeah, in some areas, yes, but in some areas, they're refusing to. And, um, you know, Again, I hope these are mission statements that they they really take into heart going forward because the the product is really good for the most part. And when I criticize something, it's cuz I'm I'm passionate about it because I know it can be better. If it's something out of their control, you know, you're never going to hear me complain about spending money and the budget, you know what I mean? It's always stuff that I feel like can be in their control. If you guys watch AEW last week's episode, not not last night, Um, Because I'm recording this on the 30th. But last week's episode, uh, um, I thought was perfect. And usually AEW, I enjoy it. But it kind of bores me by the time I turn it off. Because the matches, much like Ring of Honor, are all like the same pace. You know, um, Impact does a better job of, you know, here's an X Division match. Here's a Haas match. Here's a women's match. And and the, the pacing is different. It's not a bunch of near falls and super finishers. You know what I mean? So, But last week's AEW episode, I thought was like perfect. And I kept, I was watching and I was like, dude, Impact can do all this from just the video packages to stipulations on matches to the commentary to the interviews, the promos, like everything they did last week's episode, I really felt was perfect because everything mattered from top to bottom. And I was just thinking Impact can do this. They can do all this. They don't, this isn't budget stuff. This isn't, I have to have, have, to have the money. It's, I have to have a creative mind to make everything matter and do do things a little bit different so when i when i'm critical it's stuff that i feel like is is in their control so i want to make that really really clear first match of rebellion night two suicide versus rohi raju versus trey versus chris bay now obviously i'm doing this podcast solo because i don't even want a chance getting tw back in here and um it not recording again because his time is precious uh he was up pretty late last night doing this for you guys uh for the impact lounge listeners and uh you know i kind of feel like i let him down so uh hopefully i can do this podcast some justice and in uh, reviewing the show so uh this was a four-way x division match it was kind of an implied that 
the winner would get a future X Division title shot, but I think Josh actually said it would get him closer to a potential <laughs> X Division uh, title shot. So I really, 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 really in my heart thought Rohit Raju was going to win this match. And this is the reason I think that. Because if you go back a few weeks ago, Willie Mack won the scramble match to be the number one contender for the X Division championship. I knew he was going to win a match from the minute he announced it because he was the only one on screen that cared about that match. And when you put out the graphic, he's the guy in the middle. You know, it it was just very clear he was going to win a match. So I really felt that way with Rohit because he was the only one that acknowledged this match on television, you know. Um, I mean, Chris Bay wasn't on TV. Suicide doesn't talk. Trey was on TV, but he was talking about Ace Austin and everything. So he's the only one storyline-wise that had any investment in this match. Now, when the match finished and it was over then it dawned on me okay well here's the story being told that you know when he was he he got mad at gama singh last week because he didn't feel that he felt like he should have been mentally preparing for this match he or it was a couple of weeks ago uh but he put him in a match with hernandez instead so now i kind of feel like okay this this is actually leading towards the dissension in the desi hit squad a little bit and maybe rohit breaks off you know, uh, it kind of feels like it's going that direction, but I don't know. I think I think him and uh, uh, Mahabali Shira have a lot of legs still as a team. Uh, but the the hit squad has kind of been all over the place. Well, it has been all over the place, and I think he would be the first one to tell you that. Um, so I thought he was going to win this one. Chris Bay wins it, and uh, with a with a kick to the back of the head. So one of my pet peeves in wrestling has always been. Finisher, finisher, finisher. Uh, finishers win every match. To either finisher or roll up. You know, uh, if you if you guys watch that Kenny Omega and uh, Hangman Page against the Young Bucks, which Dave Meltzer rated like six stars or something. I mean, yeah, it was an impressive match, very athletic. But I was so fatigued watching that match because it was just these near falls, near falls. And you know, I would tell people on social media, did you buy any of those near falls? Did you really think that the match was over? Because matches end on finishers. We all know that, you know. And um, this episode of Impact of Rebellion Night 2, out of four matches, only one ended with a finisher. So I can dig that. Um, But this was a really good match that I think could have benefited from having a crowd out there. But... As far as a four-way X Division match, uh, this this really, really, really delivered. Enjoyed it a lot, and uh, didn't expect the Chris Bay win, but it's a good win for him uh, because he's someone that has a lot of potential. And if you think about Desmond Xavier when he first came to the X Division and came to Impact, you know, like people were begging for him to be on television and get some wins, and they didn't do anything with him for a long time, and there was a lot of uh, worry that he was going to leave Impact, and at the time he was the only X Division style wrestler in the X Division. And you know, you remember they were just throwing anyone in there who was, you know, under two hundred twenty five pounds. And um, now, you know, thank God he's still, you know, he's with the Rascals. He's doing good things. But Chris Bay is someone that AEW had their hand, their eyes on. So you got to do this, do right by this guy. So. um Great opening match, as opposed to last week where I just would not have gone with uh, Team ECW and Crazy Steve against OVE as the opening match, just because it was such a slow match with those old dudes in the ring. Um, Cousin Jake took on Joseph P. Ryan, and as I've said before, cancel culture I like, but so far it's just Joey Ryan. (laughs) Um, We want to see how we can really factor RVD and Katie Forbes into this going future. Is she going to be wearing pantsuits? And, you know, I think there's so much they can do with this gimmick. Um, but right now it's just Joey Ryan. I was fairly certain Joey Ryan was going to win this match because he had a one-on-one match with Jake. Not with Jake, but with Cody. And he lost. And I was like, there's no way he's going to lose to Jake even though that would be the more realistic person to lose to. I was like, there's no way he's going to lose to Jake because then the feud's done. You know, and we haven't really got that cancel culture versus the Deaners thing yet. And I like where that feud is going. I love the direction of it. So 
uh, I knew he was going to win a match. Uh, you know, this was a one of the better Joey Ryan matches we've probably seen in a long time. I saw a review on 411 Mania where he said, you know, I don't really want to watch Cousin Jake and Joey Ryan doing, you know, working body parts in an empty arena. You know, yeah, I, I get that. But it was cool to see both these guys kind of get some time. This is probably one of those matches you're going to see on Explosion. So I thought it was a really weird inclusion into Rebellion. I would have just rather... I'm sure the initial match was supposed to be the you know the tag team match. And this is what we got instead. But And, um, you know, Cody's probably stuck in Canada because I don't think Jake lives in Canada. I could be totally effing wrong on that one. But um, I see him wrestle around here locally a lot in Illinois. So I kind of feel like he's not far from this area. Especially because his uh, girlfriend's in WWE. So, um, not bad. Joey Ryan wins with uh, the roll-up. Gets a handful of the ropes. And this feud continues. I, when I, one thing that was, I thought was really funny with Madison Rain in this match. She was, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned earlier how Josh asked these questions. And they're questions we know the answers to a lot of the time. That's what bugs me. You know, would, would you say that Jordan Grace is the strongest knockout in Impact Wrestling? Like, duh. So, yes, Madison, do you think Cousin Jake should use his strength to get back into this match? And she, on point, responds with, well, he's not going to use his brains. That cracked me the F up. The delivery was amazing on that. And um, as I said, I, I have to give props when props are due. And the commentary for the show was excellent. I love that they stepped it up. But uh, let's move on. Taya and Rosemary were FaceTiming. I had no clue what the hell they were talking about. I, d I don't know if I'm, I'm just, you know, I kind of uh, have issues with the ADD and have to take medication for focus and... <laughs> Sometimes when I'm, I can check out really quickly. I had no clue what the f they were talking about, so I had to go online and look at a, a review of the show, and then I realized that Rosemary was kind of saying, "Well, I'm not wrestling Jordan Grace. I'm wrestling Havoc, so you can come and wrestle this match now." But I guess I was so confused because I'm, I'm not really big on what they're doing with Rosemary right now, and I'm, I've just been confused on her relationship with Taya because for the longest time, like, it seemed like they were trying to kind of recreate the demon bunny thing, but it was, you know, she, it was like they weren't getting along. Like, Taya thought they were best friends, but Rosemary's like, no, we're not. But then all of a sudden, Rosemary is cool with her, you know? I never saw where the transition happened. So I get a little confused with what they're doing. Um, but, Rosemary takes on Havoc. They apologize for not giving us a knockouts title match. But we get Rosemary versus Havoc. I really, really, really enjoyed that opening video package that they did where, you know, we don't really hear Havoc talk a whole lot if she's not yelling and screaming. You know, we get them, um, you know, this little video package of them going back and forth. I thought was so well done, so well put together. And that's what makes, you know, you took a random ass match and kind of made it matter. Because this Rosemary Havoc Sue Young storyline that went on for what felt like years was all over the place. All over the place. And um, and then you factor Taya into that, who's not really involved in it, but she's involved with Rosemary. So it was just really confusing. And then when you know Rosemary saved them from the Undead Realm, there was no follow-up whatsoever. So this video package was perfect because it... it it took this random match and said, okay, here's why you have to care about it. You know, and when I mentioned at the top of the show that last week's AEW show, which I was thought was perfect, they did those little things. And uh, this was, I just, I, I can't say anything bad about it. Love that. Now the match itself, this would have probably done better with a crowd, with a live crowd. I'm a big Full Metal Mayhem fan, uh, but we didn't really get any tables, I don't think. Or ladders. Um, but we, you know, we got everything. All the metal that they could find. You know, they brought out the staple gun early. And I think my favorite spot of the match was... I don't remember what. I think she tried to hit Rosemary with a chair maybe over the head. I forgot what it was. And uh, Rosemary put on that hard hat. <laughs> that was funny. Um, I thought the talking at the beginning of the match was kind of weird. But that's what threw me off. Um, is Rosemary... 
a ba- uh, a heel now. I mean, she was begging to get out of the out of the match. Basically, Havoc was kind of wrestling as the baby face, and that's where I mean the inconsistencies going on with that have have been. It's it just like I said, the storyline's been all over the place. You've had Sue versus Havoc multiple times, but they're both heels, and uh, Rosemary doing the thing with Taya. You know, one month, one week she's kind of getting drink, drunk, and next she's in the undead realm. Like it was just so all over the place. So I don't understand. I don't like was Havoc just kind of playing the babyface role for the match, or is she a babyface now? I don't. I don't think so. I wouldn't think she is. But now I feel like they're going heel with Rosemary. So I'm I'm just so confused. And uh, the best part of this match though was that Nevaeh came out. I've been preaching. For as long as I can remember, probably since OVE even showed up, you know, why isn't Nevaeh there? OVE needs a female member. And I even said as you know, last week that a female member or leader of OVE could would serve as a good repackage and redirection for them to where all this losing that they were doing, like, you know, a female leader could show up and be like, what the F is going on? Much like Kingston did for LAX when they were, you know, going on their losing streak. But the way that Nevaeh was presented here, I don't think she's going to have anything to do with OVE. I'd, I'd be shocked. Uh, she, if she's not debuting as the leader of OVE, I don't see a connection on screen. Madison Rain knew who she was. Josh had no clue who she was. Uh, but I'm really happy she's there. They they did a really good job um, as a tag team and women are wrestling. And uh, she's she's a good addition. They needed more knockouts, and you know if you're ever ever able to expand this division into like a tag division, or where you can have a tag division, you know you got the Killer Death Machines there, which would be f effing awesome. But I'm really happy she showed up. I was was really excited about it. Uh, the match itself, though, entertaining, and Rosemary ends up getting the win, hitting Havoc with a lead pipe, plastic pipe, who knows what it was. But she gets the win, and we didn't really get any kind of follow-up of Nevaeh, you know, what she was there for. But I would imagine this is going to lead to some Nevaeh and Havoc versus Rosemary and Taya Valkyrie, which I absolutely could get down with. I That would be awesome. Um, I, I'm all for fresh knockouts matches, and I can, I can definitely dig that right there. Um, we got a throwback match, flashback. Of uh, Sammy versus Rich Swan. Now, this was, you know, kind of widely viewed as one of the best impact matches in a while. I think it was a mistake. Someone even mentioned this to me on Facebook. They said, you know, you know they're going to put these flashbacks in there, which would be kind of silly considering we're watching no crowd right now. It's already depressing enough watching these flashbacks with these large crowds and then watching the current state of the product. But to go from a hot crowd to nobody is even more depressing. But that particular match, when I had reviewed it, I, I you know, I, I had pointed out back then that I checked out uh, at one point of the match. You know, Sammy Callahan beat a lot of people with a cactus special. But when he hit when he blinded Rich Swan with powder, hit the cactus special off the second rope onto Legos and didn't win the match, I absolutely checked out. And I'm kinda going back to you know, the Young Bucks versus Omega and Page that I was talking about where there were so many near falls in that match that I, I checked out at one point. And with this particular match, I, I checked out. And I thought Sammy should have won, so, you know, uh, that's that. But that was the flashback that they gave us. Really hot crowd, really, really hot crowd. Um, main event time. I did a whole podcast on this on are we getting TNA versus Impact. And it even made me think about the lockdown match where Madison didn't announce her team yet. She she could actually do a TNA knockout team. I'm thinking. You know what I mean? But anyway. Moose. Well, not Moose. Uh, Michael Elgin comes out. And I thought Elgin really found a way to shine these last couple episodes. Just doing promos and interviews. And, uh, you know, he came out. Said some great things on the microphone. Not gonna, not gonna get into all, but I, I really enjoyed it. 
wanted to be crowned the new Impact World Champion. Moose comes out, and unfortunately, this was spoiled for me. And when I say spoiled, it means I didn't watch the show live because I, my, I just couldn't with my kids that night. Uh, but I saw on social media that Moose had the belt, and I wanted to shout out Luke Avery. I told him I'd shout him out um, because he said something in the comments that made everything make sense. If you guys remember at the TNA show for WrestleCon, there was supposed to be a world title match, King of the Mountain. And people were like, they, they kind of kind of slid that in real quick as for the world title. But then they were focusing so much on, you know, the joke of people not knowing the rules of the King of the Mountain match. But they did say it was for the world title. And of course, people were like, Tessa Blanchard's going to be in the King of the Mountain match, you know? It just sounded really silly. And if you think about, like, Impact has been telling us on TV that this was going to happen. We were just all too, not all of us, but some of us just too dumb to see it coming. Uh, that includes myself, not just on anybody. Um, you know, they kept talking about Moose, you're not a champion, you never won a title, this and this and this. But he's going to be in this world title King of the Mountain match. It's clear, and this is actually pretty genius, but it, it's it's clear that this TNA world title was going to be on the line for this King of the Mountain match, and Moose was going to win it there. But because that didn't happen, you know, they pretty much delivered it where Moose dug the title out of the trash, basically, um, and is wearing it. But I'm still optimistic with it going forward because everything Moose does is really good. He was dressed like the freaking Ultimate Warrior. He even nailed the splash. Like, it looked like the Warrior splash, but... Everything Moose does is so good, and that's why I'm optimistic about it. I don't know if they're going to try to do an Impact versus TNA thing. You know, you'd obviously have to bring back some people and have some star power, but then you could actually get cancel culture in there and Madison Rain in there. Like, there's there's a way to do it. I don't. I just. I don't know if that's what they're trying to do. You know, the whole invasion angle, because um, that's kind of hard to pull off, and unless you have the star power to do it. I'm not sure it worked because if you think about the whole the old WCW ECW angle, the invasion, they didn't have enough star power on that side, so they had to have people jump ship and all this crap. And if you were to do that, the TNA side would be the heels, and they would win a majority of the matches because that's how it works. And then then you have TNA Impact, the current Impact talent putting over the older TNA talent. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't jive. So I don't. I, I, I'm still up in the air if I think that's where they're going with it. But, you know, Moose comes down, um, has a really nice exchange with Michael Elgin. I had to laugh when Elgin starts talking. He's like, that's the last time you'll interrupt me again. <laughs> awesome, Moose. Um, Hernandez comes down, cuts one of the worst promos in Impact history, but he's not really a talker. And uh, I kind of had to laugh. The, the only times in this match where I kind of laughed at the commentary was when Madison Rain said that w Willie... Mac and Rich Swan shouldn't be driving around and partying. They should be watching this match. I don't think during a pandemic anyone's partying or out celebrating and having fun. <laughs> but the other one was that they were actually presenting Hernandez as uh, a potential number one contender. And that he, he could be Tessa Blanchard's toughest opponent to date. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, I do like Hernandez. I guess he's going to be around for a while. So I'm excited about that. I wanted the OGs to stay around. I really thought they could have, I thought it would have been interesting to break them away from LAX and just find someone else to feud with, you know? But um, Hernandez is around. He comes down and then makes this a triple threat. And I enjoyed this triple threat match for a, for a big man match. This is probably one of the longest matches I can remember seeing Hernandez in. And uh, he hung with these guys. Michael Elgin's always amazing. Moose is already always amazing. So this was a good main event. This was really enjoyable for me. And unfortunately, I knew Moose was going to win the match. And he did, of course. And he asked to be crowned the new TNA World Champion. So lots of optimism going forward. And as I said in my last podcast, they were really happy with the, the viewership for the TNA show. Apparently, it was great. It would have been better if it was a better show. You know what I mean? I think Impact kind of went halfway in on it and then saw that the, the numbers were up and were like, oh, shit. You know, and again, that goes back to last week. If you're going to do something, go all in. You know, 
for me, that was kind of a halfway show. And, um, you know, when I say that, it's because you've got video packages for the X Division and the knockouts, but you're not delivering any kind of X Division or knockouts matches. You know what I mean? Go all in. But um, lots of optimism here because they can, if they do this right, they can really propel Moose to that next level of main event talent. And I think it's hard because you actually got two people in Elgin and, and Moose who could legitimately take the title off Tesla and everyone would be happy for it. Like both of those guys need a world title run. Um, so it's nice that we got multiple people on the roster who are hungry for a world title. And I really think if you bring Eric Young and you've got another guy who really wants the world title. So um, the main event scene could get really interesting soon. And this might lead to Eric Young versus Moose because Moose has actually challenged them online. You know, if they're able to throw some money at guys like EC3 and Spud, you know, because we got some e the TNA guys who are free agents now who weren't a free agent when they were recording this TNA show. You know, does Anthem step up and be like, okay, we're we're getting these guys. We are we are bringing them on, um, and you could do something really special. So we're gonna see what they do. Again, this is BQ. Thank you for listening to this review, and uh, rolling with the punches. And I'll talk to you soon. Peace. <laughs>